Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything, number 219. It's 219, the July 24th edition of the show. I'm Gary. And I'm Chris. All right, so we have got a lot to discuss today. Of course, it is uh, the beginning of our SEC football previews, and we'll jump into the other conferences as we get closer to football season. Uh, but there's a lot to talk about. First off, mybookie.ag is the sponsor of the show. Go check them out. Promo code WCE50 get you a 50% deposit bonus. Uh, that's if you put in 100 bucks, they're going to give you 50 bucks for free. You can't get a better deal than that. You put in 25 bucks, they're going to give you 12.50 for free. Whatever you want to do. 50% for free, whatever you deposit. So, they are the best online sports book, the best layout. Check them out, mybookie.ag, promo code WCE50. As far as following us on Twitter and whatnot, you can do that easily. You follow me, at GaryWCE. You follow Chris, Chris B. Giannini. And you can also follow us, at Winning Cures. You can also check out the website, which also sponsors this podcast, winningcureseverything.com. we got a bunch of stories. we got all kind of different videos and whatnot up there. So check it out. And with that, we're going to move into story number one. All right, so in lieu of story number one, we're just going to have a, a crock pot of stories. We called it the blurbs last week, so we'll call it the blurbs again. Basically, all it is is a list of stories that don't really deserve their own segment, but we'll talk about all of them anyway. No, they need to be talked about. Huh? Yeah, and and but not necessarily a five to ten minute conversation on each one. Correct. Right? So we'll start out with this one. Rob Manfred, N uh, MLB commissioner, stated he wants to expand from 30 teams to 32, and he actually listed cities. Now, did you see this? Yeah. Okay. Portland, Las Vegas, Charlotte, Nashville, and in Canada, Montreal and Vancouver – and then he li he didn't say a specific city, but places in Mexico is what he said. What are your thoughts on on taking this international for them? Well, the international part I like a lot. I think um, the Mexico cities would do really really well. Baseball is having a problem with attendance right now, and the Latin American countries just that that is their number one sport outside of soccer. It it ranks up there with ratings as high as football, um, and so I think that it is wise to go after that market. I don't it, think that would be unwise. As much as I love – so, A, we knew this was going to happen. All we needed was one team to put a pro team in Vegas. I've been saying this for a decade. One team does it. One league does it. All the rest are going to flock. It is going to be a wild success. They are all looking at hockey right now saying, holy crap, what if we would have been the first? Um, and so <laughs> I do believe that a team will be in Vegas. Um Nashville is like the coolest, hippest city in the country right now. You know, it is the new Austin, um, what Austin was for the last decade, I think. And uh, I don't know how long lived that is. I would love to see it just because it's close to us. And around here in the South, we've got a lot of baseball teams, but they're pretty spread out. Like where we live, you're there's, driving there's what? five to six hours away before you get to yeah. your closest place. From Memphis, it's uh, Atlanta, St. Saint, Louis. St. Louis is five, Atlanta's six. And then after you get those, I mean, you're going nine hours. Yeah, I mean, you're going to what, like Dallas Cincinnati and Houston? Cincinnati and Dallas and Houston. God, Houston's longer than that. Yeah. So Good um, you, you go a long way before you get to baseball, and baseball's pretty big in the South. So uh, it was just one of those things where I, I wouldn't mind Nashville and Vegas, but – my thought is this, and, and so many leagues are so against it. I'm not a big fan of just – and I know we're going a little longer on the blurb here. No, it's okay. But I'm not a fan of just ripping teams out of cities. But at some point in time, you got to realize nobody's going to baseball in Florida. They're just not. No. That, Florida needs to – Tampa Bay's about to build even, another stadium. Even when they were, like, no. good. Great. Tampa and Miami both need to lose theirs. You add two more cities, you can do Nashville, you can do Vegas, you can be in the two hip cities – fun cities, and then you put two teams in Mexico. If I was the commissioner, that would be what I'd do. Tampa Bay is about to spend a lot of money on a new stadium again, another one. I get, no, no, we don't want your stadium. It's not going to bring people. It just isn't. Yeah, I think I agree with you. So I think I agree. At, Canada's already got Toronto. And it'd Montreal be, it, didn't work out last time. Yeah, it didn't work out the last time, so why would you go back? Yeah, I just don't understand that part of it. Vancouver... It, Look, they didn't support the Grizzlies. Like, the Grizzlies moved. I, I, and, and I understand NBA and MLB are 
two completely no, different things. I get that. but I'm not against going to Canada, but the difference is if you put a team in Vegas, people will come from all over the world to go to that team. Yeah. All the, the Latin American countries that want an MLB team or to want to watch their Latin American players, they're all going to go to Vegas. Yeah. Um, and, and so that, that team has to – if you're going to expand, that has to be an expansion. Um, and, and I think Mexico is just a solid choice because of the Latin American well, culture. So, so long as you can work it out with their government and everything else. Yeah, right? but we like work you, it you out gotta, with Toronto. Like, we don't have a problem. These leagues don't have that issue. Our yeah. country has that issue. These leagues don't. I, I agree. I agree. All right, next up, uh, it was big news, what, last Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever it was. That's right. Um, Kawhi Leonard to the Raptors and DeMar DeRozan to the Spurs. And the Spurs didn't only give up Kawhi, they gave up Danny Green. There's not a lot of three-point shooting left on this Spurs team. Do do either team, does either team win this trade? Oh, yeah, yeah, I think the Spurs win this trade big. First, the Spurs, you know the reason why the Spurs always have, this is kind of a known fact from NBA insider guys, the Spurs have the best shooting coach in the league. That's the reason they, they're able to turn out three-point shooter after three-point shooter. There is no doubt two or three guys will show up this year on this roster that we've never heard of as three-point shooters, and they'll be three of the best in top you know 15 in the league. DeMar DeRozan's already a top 15 player in the NBA. He signed for three years. The, the Raptors are getting a rental player. They paid a lot. And I also think that the Spurs got a pick, too. Yeah, it was so, super protected, though. Yeah, well, like, no, it's not that protected. I know it's a number it, one it's a, protected. It's top but, twenty protected. Oh well, yeah. But but you're and, not really and worried if it, about and it. And if they don't get it this year, then it turns into two second rounds after that. That's right. So so you know that's. Fine. I, I think DeRozan for Kawhi right now is a win, knowing that one guy's locked up for three years and the other guy is a one year wonder, and he's off to L.A. I just don't see him being able to sell him on staying. I don't think so either. But, it, look, people have brought up the idea that Kawhi Leonard doesn't like the spotlight. What place in the world is less spotlight, at least for the NBA, than Toronto? No, that's true. But here's the difference, though. See, I don't think – I couldn't see Kawhi Leonard, like, hanging out with Drake. You the know? first thing's first. <laughs> don't tell me you don't like the spotlight, but you want to go to L.A., Okay. And you've been such a diva about well, I mean, this he's, whole thing. he's from there. I don't care. That doesn't matter. When you were there, you weren't rich and famous. So don't tell me you you like the spotlight. You don't want the spotlight. You well, don't I guess want the spotlight. The, the other thing you about go to places like Charlotte. Well, no, the other you go thing, places like Memphis, and New Orleans. Where the nobody other thing knows your about name. the like not wanting the spotlight in L.A. If you're an NBA superstar like Kawhi Leonard, like you just another guy walking down the block. Yeah, but the spotlight is but but there's TMZ walking down that same block watching yeah. everything you do. That's you come true. To, go ask go ask Tony Allen how many times A everybody in Memphis loved him. How many people bothered him? And how many people messed with him? None. We walked down the street, none. Zebo, where they found home at. Now those are two different guys in Kawhi. Agreed. Ask Mark and Mike. Those are more Kawhi speed. You know, and, and I know Memphis because I know this 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 area because of where we're from. But I think New Orleans would be the same. I think Charlotte would be the same. You got rich people in these towns all over the place. They would see that that person's rich, but they wouldn't go bother them. In yeah. L.A., people have no qualms about that's a famous person. I'm gonna go get an autograph. That's a famous person. I'm gonna take the picture. Or hey, I'm TMZ, and who you going out with tonight? Who's that girl in your arm? Who's this? Who's that? Yeah, they want to know everything. Questions. Nobody asks you those questions in these small towns. None. Yeah. No, you're right. I so do, I do kind of like that. The old joke was that Pop was going to send him to Siberia. He sent him to Siberia. He, he sent him pretty damn close to Siberia. That's right. So. All right. Larry Fedora at ACC Media Days last Wednesday. Now, you saw this, right? Yes, I mean, it, it made huge headlines and whatnot. Uh, he said football is under attack. Mm -hmm. He said if football goes down, the country goes down with it. He said that CTE has not been proven to be connected with football. Uh, what the hell? Like, tell me how long until North Carolina gets rid of Because this is embarrassing. Like, he, he did not just say it in his speech. Like, the sports information director for North Carolina realized what was happening because as soon as he said this stuff, tweets started firing out. Well, yeah, that's the world and, we live in. Right, and as soon as all this stuff starts to make head on social media and it starts to go viral, he went out to a few select reporters and said, hey, 
you know, Coach Fedora wants to clarify a few things with you guys. Like, can y'all stick around another 10 or 15 after he gets done on the stage? And he wants to talk to y'all about what he said. And then he comes out and he doubles down on everything. There was a study done on 111 former football players. And out of the 111, 110 had CTE. That's just one of a ton of different stories. Like, Football is not going to be able to get away from CTE. Like that it it is just a part of it and if you understand it and you know what you're getting yourself into, then okay. But for a coach to think that it, like at one you should be worried about the safety of your players, right? I think any rational coach would maybe not rational. Any good public speaking coach that understands the scenario would have, one, not even touched the subject because it wasn't asked of him. He just brought it up. But two, they would understand that it is a whole different climate now, right? What What are your thoughts on this? Does Does North Carolina find a way to get rid of him if he doesn't have a good year this year? No, I mean, I wouldn't get rid of him because of this. I mean, this here's the thing. So, y- yes, it's not a smart thing to say. But we've always talked about this. Outside of football, these guys would barely be T E P E teachers. Yeah. Like it's not a lot like of they'd be it's not like they'd be Now successful there's some that would be good at, at other things. Very few. Very but few. very few. These guys are borderline Neanderthals. They're just really smart at football. Okay. <laughs> so thanks you have an opinion. Here's the thing. There's something that he kind of brought up in his thing though, and and he I kinda admire what he's saying in the sense of I played football. And, and and I didn't play it super long, but I learned a lot about life for it. I learned a lot about competing for something that I wanted. I learned that, you know, it's not just going to be handed to me. I've got to go work for it. And if somebody outworks me, they get it. Yeah. And then I'm standing there without it. And that's and that, just part, that of it. part of it. I don't disagree like, with. But, well, you, you gotta, but the CTE th- but thing is, is where is. I'm pointing this, at. But he doesn't understand. He, there's, A, what we know about CTE and head trauma today is going to be drastically different than what we're going to know in 10 years or in 20 years. That That's just true. That's just what medical science is going to tell us. It's a million different things. We've been around studying diets and weight loss and healthy living for a long time. And today it's 2018 and we still can't agree on what the healthiest way to live is. So, so science is always kind of taking that next step. I, there's no doubt CTE is from head trauma. The other st- side of that is Mark Schlereth kind of defended him. Okay. And I shared this post out on Twitter the other day and he talked about how he agrees with the sense of without things like football, all of these men playing this game and working in this game would probably be doing something that is detrimental to their health because life is about, you get more out of life for having purpose than you do doing something healthy. Okay, that makes sense. And and so, the, so many of these guys, as soon as they coaches, especially as soon as they quit playing, they die. You know, the yeah. guys with the with that that played and hurt lived a long time, but as soon as they stop being around football, their body gives out. They have nothing to live for anymore. They have nothing that they're fighting for. And so, while head trauma is a serious thing that this game has to figure out, we also have to understand that all of these people that do this game. It gives them purpose in life. And regardless of if that purpose is valuable to you or to anyone else, it's valuable to them. It yeah. gives them a reason to wake up in the morning and go to work and to do put their body at risk. It's not for the money. Agreed. Yes, they make an obscene amount of money compared to you and I and standard people, but it is the least profitable sport for the player out of every major sport out there. Every golfer, just about, that makes the PGA Tour and plays in all four majors will make more than almost every NFL player except for the top 1%. Every baseball player, there are guys in the minors that bounce back and forth that will make more money than a lot of these NFL players in baseball. Um, you know, hockey and soccer, and, 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 and yeah, God, soccer is obscene amounts of money once you get into Europe. Yeah. I mean, it's just not even crazy. So if these guys who are the best athletes in the world were to play another sport, if they picked another sport to go dominate, then then they would make grossly more than what they're making now. 
Agreed. This game gives them purpose. Agreed. So we need to remember that. I don't think you fire a guy for not being smart about science. He's not a science teacher. He's a football coach. I'm working under the assumption that outside of football, you're dumb at everything else. Agreed. Agreed. So I, I, I'm curious because North Carolina has a, a certain reputation that they uphold. As far as being a smarter university, et cetera, et cetera. Sure? Because they also are the university that had like underwater academic, classes that, yeah, that academic didn't really fraud. Exist. I'm, I understand. Yeah, I, I think, got all that. I think North and they are right in the heart of the South, where it is very much you know tough it up. That the people around where we live still believe have questions about CTE, no matter how much science you give them. So Agreed. he is probably in the best place for this. If he was at Cal. Berkeley, if he was at Stanford? I, th- I think if he was in the SEC, he would be fine. I think at North Carolina, it's a little bit different. I, I don't see North Carolina any better than any of our SEC schools. We shall see. We shall see. All right, we're, we're going to wrap up with this. Uh, Ryan Nanny, SB Nation, our buddy uh, at Celebrity Hot Tub. We got to get him back on the show. Uh, he wrote an article for SB Nation, and he doesn't write a whole lot. But he said why it should cost one point to punt. Now, he's got some interesting points here. Let me go through the the seven points. Okay. All right. One, keep games closer. He said, this is explanation here, and I'm not going to explain every one, but this is the main reason, right? Right now, one purpose to punt serves is to protect the lead. It doesn't eliminate that entirely, but it does compromise it. Punt on your last three possessions in the current system with a 17-point lead, and your opponent has to score every time they get the ball. Do the same thing under this new system where it costs a point to punt every time, and now they only need two touchdowns. Essentially, we're making coaches really consider whether or not to punt rather than just do it because it's the comparatively safe option. Number two was it's more balanced than you'd think. Uh, FBS teams punted a combined 82-33 times last year. Now, that's 8,000-plus points to distribute. The difference is Alabama and Ohio State – each had 39 more punts forced than punts themselves. So that wouldn't change much right there, right? Uh, number three, coaches will have to go for it on fourth down more often, which makes things more entertaining. Correct. Number four, when coaches elect to punt, it's going to feel weightier. Absolutely, because every time you punt, you're giving up a you're point. You're giving up a point. So say you score a touchdown early, and then you're just playing. What well, a seven to nothing lead can end up being three to nothing. In a quarter. So it, it won't weigh as much, or it will weigh more. Fake punts would be even more satisfying. I am I agree with that. Fake punts are already awesome, but if you fake one during this, I mean, that's awesome. Uh, it rewards defenses more tangibly. And then number seven, scores are going to get really, really funny. And I'm cool with that. He brings up Michigan beating Rutgers a couple of years ago. Yeah. 78 to nothing. So, <laughs> he said, uh, Michigan punted four times, so let's mark them down to 74. Rutgers, 16 punts, which would make a final score of 74 to negative 16. And then he said, hell yes. So, the qu- the kicker is, is what do you do if you're at negatives? Do, or just every time you punt, you just give the other team a point. That way you never have negatives. Cause you, I'm, I'm curious. Because what happens if you go three and out your first drive? Like, you... Now you're punting. Yeah. You, you, well, you can't go past zero because we'll never have it. So, but I like this. I like this. I know that he's there's there's a if lot. If you don't of, go past zero, then you're good. But it, as long as you've got points on the board, it will cost you a point if you. I, I say no. I'm, I'm, I'm I in say with every, that. No, I say every time you punt, you just give the other team a point. That's fine. It's the same concept. It changes nothing about the concept. Uh, that makes sense. That makes sense. It okay. changes nothing. It just means when you're o o and you start the game three and out, the other team's going to start out one nothing. If you punt, and and I'm for this, so because, a seven nothing lead yes. could actually end up being eight nine, nine ten, ten to nothing. That's right, correct. Before the other team ever even scores, correct. Like that's uh-huh. that's that's the way I would do it because you have the question of what do you do when when the team is at zero. Um, but I love this concept. I hate kicking the football at all points. I think there are several high school coaches that have won multiple state championships that have this philosophy of they never punt, they onside kick every time, and the math tells you it's the right thing to do. Um, In college, it's probably different. The math wouldn't tell you it's right every time, but I think it tells you it's right more than not. 
and I think it would save a lot of jobs and it would cost a lot of jobs. But I'm for this. College football will never do it. Pro football will never do it. I wish that XFL would absolutely in, in It'd be awesome. This. Yeah. If you could see it work in another league, yeah. it'd be great. Yep. It'd be great. All right, we're going to move into our SEC East preview. So this is our SEC East preview. And we decided to do by divisions, at least on this. We may do the other conferences, you know, the entire conference at one time because there's not a whole lot to talk about with some of them. But we're going to jump into the SEC East, and we'll start out. We're just going to do it alphabetical order. Is that all right? Fine. Okay. Let's start with Florida. First things first, Florida has got the easiest schedule, according to Phil Steele, of anybody in the conference. It's the number uh, 64 toughest schedule. But that's because, it really, their road games at Florida State, at Tennessee, at Vanderbilt, at Mississippi State, right? So, Tennessee, people don't expect a whole lot. Vandy, of course not. Uh, at Mississippi State, I think it's going to be tough. And then at Florida State, we still don't know what's up with Willie Taggart and, and what they're going to be. First year right? coach. And so, and they, they weren't good last year under Jimbo after losing the quarterback. They get the quarterback back, whatever. So, let's go ahead and jump in. They went 4-7 and seven last year. What do you think they've got this year? What's the over-under? The over-under, as of my bookie, is 8.5 wins. I think they go under that. I got them at 8-4. and four. All right. Now, I have them at 9-3. and three. What uh, you think Dan Mullins is four games better, five games better than what they were last year? I do. Uh, the other side of this is that they are the most experienced team in the SEC because they remember they're getting all those guys that got suspended back. Yeah, but undisciplined they, players, I just don't. I'm never going to put a lot of faith in. They get Jordan nope. Scarlett back. Okay, they how get many stars they've got on. They've got 112 name. offensive line starts between the five guys. They return all five offensive linemen. They have a stable running backs. I don't think they're going to be great, but I think it's hard not to get to eight or nine wins with this schedule. You might be right, but I've I've got them at nine and three, and We're not my far off. my I, three I eight and four. here's my three losses. Okay, I've got at Mississippi State, Georgia, and then until they beat Florida State in Tallahassee, I'm going to give Florida State that win. That's that's just my thinking on it because I, I got to see it to believe it. Okay. All right, so what what are you going with on – what's what's your fourth loss? My fourth loss? Well, A, I, I have them losing to South Carolina and LSU. So. Oh, okay, you got them losing to LSU. Yep. All right, so South Carolina, LSU, and you've got them beating Florida State. Got them beating Florida State. I've got them losing to Tennessee, and I've got them losing to Georgia. Okay. Now, the Georgia thing, I can understand that. The Tennessee game, they're, I guess that's – They're that's, at Tennessee. I think Jeremy Pruitt's going to show some people – how bad the coaching has been for the last decade. I I think a, an, I think a grown up sitting in that chair, and and when I use the word grown up, I mean that literally. An yeah. adult male sitting in that chair, I think, is going to show them Tennessee can win. You just need somebody who's not a complete idiot. I, I'm okay. I'm with you. I'm with you. So, um, that's that. I'm gonna touch on him in my hot take later. That's fine. Uh, Georgia. Let's move on to that. Last year they went eleven and one, seven and one in the conference. They lost at Auburn last year. I have them eleven and one again. You got them nine and three. What was their over under? Over under was ten and a half. So I got them under there too. Yep, you got them under on that. So I've I've got them over the. But I, I'm not super confident because let's just be real. Not a whole lot of uh, of returning experience here. I just think there's also a lot of. I mean, it, miracles. I, I was the one guy that doubted Kirby the whole time last week, last year. Um, didn't didn't foresee him being that strong, that good. I also know football is an oblong shape that bounces weird and funny. And True. You're not. I mean, I couldn't tell you what games. Well, they they I think won a lot win. of. And I'll tell you this: like, yeah. I don't have a lot of wins and losses. I just know what I think their record's going to be when it's over with. I can't tell you who they're going to win, beat, who they're going to lose to. Any of that stuff, I just know this. I don't see them just running the table again like it's nothing because they're Georgia and they recruit really well and Kirby's the second coming of Nick Saban. I think at some point in time the SEC is going to get better. Games are going to get harder, and 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 you're going to lose some. 
Over the last four years, Georgia has recruited their average player is a 3.8. That's number two in the conference behind Alabama, who is a 3.92. So they are, as far as talent goes, light years ahead of everybody else on their schedule other than Auburn, and even then it's still pretty, pretty big, significant. Pretty significant. So I've got Georgia at 11-1. Now, the reason I have them 11-1, and I've got them losing at South Carolina. Yep. And, and then I think they run the table from there. But it's still early, the first road game. You saw what Jake Fromm did in his only hostile road game last year at Auburn. Completely crapped the bed. The whole That's team right. did. And then you saw what they did like when they had the, the safe confines of, uh, of Mercedes-Benz Stadium. That's right. Like They completely flipped the script on them. And this go-round, Georgia, I think, just has more talent. But their schedule, you know, there's at LSU, at Missouri, at Kentucky – they got the cocktail party. Florida will show up for that. Yeah, and I think Florida will show up, but I, I, I just don't know that Florida's good enough at this point. Like, I, I like Dan Mullen. I just don't think they're good enough yet. I don't know the answer. Like I said, I'm, I, just, I just don't think that you can wake up, take a program over, and all of a sudden be 11-1 and one back-to-back years, 10-2 and two just in your sleep. This game's not that easy. It's just I, not. You, I think yeah, – hey, look, I'm with you on so, that. I'm with you. I've got them at 11-1. and one. I've got them 7-1 and one in the SEC. Okay. Next up, Kentucky. Let's roll through very quickly. They went seven and five last year. That's two straight years at seven and five. They beat Louisville two years ago. Lost to them last year. What at home? Is yep. that right? Yep. So they play them at Louisville this year. Uh, I don't like Kentucky much this year. They've got the sixth toughest schedule in the SEC. It's number number uh, thirty nine in the country. They have the number thirteen least experienced team. So, like, the only team that has less experience in the conference is LSU. Yep. They don't have a starting quarterback returning. They got Benny Snell coming back, the running back. But as far as offensive line starts, they've only got 60 offensive line starts, which is number 80 in the country and number 12 – sorry, number 11 in the SEC. I've, I've got them at 4-8 and eight this year. Okay. What's their over-under? Their over-under is – I'm going to ask Kentucky this for all the teams. Is, Kentucky is 5.5. I would go under. I've got them at five and seven. All right. Now, who do you have them beating? I mean, like I said, I don't. I, I forget. That's, okay. That, I mean, okay. you know, I just pick a number and I say this is what I think they could do. Well, see, could there's, they, there's toss could they games. beat Louisville and and lose to Central Michigan? Sure, I've got them beating Central Michigan and losing to Louisville. But at some point in time, I think it all is going to work out. I, I think that their their hardest games are at home. And then the toss-up games are on the road, so you kind of have to toss it to the next, you know, the other Hang team. On. They they play Florida on the road and A and M on the road, and Tennessee and Missouri. And you said and their Louisville. hardest games are at home. Yeah, they've got uh, let's Florida see. and Ten- and 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 A and M aren't hard. No, well, no, they've got Mississippi State, South Carolina. Uh, now look, Vanderbilt is one thing, but they've got Georgia at home. Okay. So Georgia, South yeah, Carolina. Yeah, they got to play everybody in the East, and half of them they'll play at home, and half of them they won't. Well, it, here's here's the thing: they got Georgia, South Carolina, and Mississippi State at home, and I think they lose all three of those. That's I think they lose at Texas A and M and at Florida. I think they lose at Missouri because that's a toss up game, and then at Tennessee because I think Pruitt's going to have that turned around. I got them at four and eight. Okay. So either way, that's under five and a half. Okay. So I'm down that's with that. That's a lot of time on Kentucky. Yeah. Well, that nobody cares about. <laughs> Uh, Missouri, another team that not a whole lot of people care about, but that's okay. Over under we care. Is what? Over under for Missouri is seven and a half. Oh God, dang! Whew. I've got them under that. Yeah, I got them under that by a lot. I'm three. And, I'm three and nine. Holy God! With Drew Locke at quarterback. Okay. All right. Yeah. I've got them at six and six. You got them at three and nine. I got them at three and nine. Call me when they get a head coach. Because I think coaching matters in the in, in college football. Uh, okay, I understand. I think coaching that. matters in the SEC. And you you think that they won last year because of Josh Heupel? I mean, I don't. The OC know that went to Central Florida. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that offense looked really, really good. Because I, I, mean, I don't was, know, it was a really good offense. I had no it, idea it what won games do. for them. Yeah, defensively they didn't win games. But who's their head coach? At Barry Odom, who's yeah, it's a defensive, defensive guy. coordinator. Yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, I just don't. I don't know. I think I the SEC East Dooley. is. I think the SEC East is getting better. I think it's light years better than it was two years ago. 
I mean, I mean, yeah. worlds, leaps and bounds better than it was two years ago. And in two, like on your yeah thing there, Missouri is number thirteen in the conference as far as recruits go. Yeah. Their average player is three point oh six stars. They just don't have talent. So they uh, they do have the fourth, and I don't think they have coaching. They've got the fourth toughest schedule in the SEC, the number twenty seven in the country, but they do have a lot of experience coming back. But I just don't think it's a lot of talent. Yeah, I was about to say it doesn't matter if it's not like good. I, I think things broke pretty well for them last year. Move on to South Carolina. All right. Now this is where you're getting excited. Right? This is where things change. This a is uh, Coach Boom is your boy. Yeah. Will Muschamp. Yeah. Year three. I'm, I'm a big. They, I'm a big uh, Muschamp guy. They went eight and four in the regular season last year. Correct. Lost the best player in week three. Week three. Yep. To uh, in the Kentucky game. The and then they game. lost the, the, the Kentucky yeah. game. Yeah. Now they have lost four straight years to Kentucky. I'm going to say, I, look, hot take just for this. They're, they're swapping that this year. They're, they're not going to lose that game. They're going to Lexington. <laughs> South Carolina will win this ball game, hands down. Come see me if they don't, and what, I will apologize. What a, but I'm not going to be wrong here. What, what, is their under, what is their over-under? Their over-under is seven. Yeah, they're going to blow that out of the water. That's what, do you that's got what I think. I got South Carolina at 10-2 and two this year. Do you really? I've got them 10-2. and two. I have them at 10-2 and two as well. All right, now tell me who you've got them losing to. So the two losses, one is to Clemson. Of course, of and, course. I don't and, think they're on that level yet. And I, I I, wrote down on my paper that we filled out, like I got them losing at Ole Miss. But it's just one of those things where I think they're going to lose an SEC game. I don't know what game, but I'm it, I, and I was going to make sure it was a road game. I think they're going to lose an SEC game. I think it's going to be a road game. I think my options are they'll lose to Ole Miss, they'll lose to Florida, but they play pretty much everybody else that scares you at home. A and M's a little scary, but they get A and M at home. Well, listen, I'm just going to read this off. All right, the beginning of their schedule before their bye week, they've got Coastal Carolina at home, Georgia at home, Marshall at home, at Vandy, at Kentucky, Missouri at home, A and M at home. They should. There's no reason why they shouldn't be seven and zero. Right there. Well, Georgia is a tough that, W. Okay. You're just I'm chalking sorry. up like it ain't right. nothing. That, there's no reason. You, can, you made Georgia 11-1, <laughs> and one, and there's no reason they shouldn't be undefeated going into that, that game. There's, there's no reason they shouldn't be at least 5-2. and two. How's that? All right. So Because yeah, A&M, they, well, we don't know what they're going to do. I'm going to disagree with that as well. A&M's a good football team. They That's could what easily, I'm saying. They, they could easily lose that game. They could lose to A&M and lose Georgia. Game. Yes. But I don't but see All the losing. rest of those games – they should not lose. They should not lose to Missouri. Now, Kentucky, I know when you Vandy, just chalk Marshall, W's whatever. up on, on paper, it, it don't ever work out that way. I but, understand. But I understand. I, uh, I've got them losing at Florida. Yeah. I think they'll go to Ole Miss and, and find a way to win that one. But two straight road games. I mean, Ole Miss is that team, though, right? They're the team that likes to play teams late in the season that have something to play for and just piss them off. Yeah. I mean, that, that kind of routinely happens. That, that seems like what they'll be. And we'll get yeah. to the SEC West preview next week. But – uh, but yeah, I've got them at ten and two. I've got them seven and one in the conference. Uh, and with the win over Georgia, like I got South Carolina winning winning the East. Oh yeah, me too. No problem, no doubt. All right, let's move to Tennessee, and then we'll we'll close out with Vanderbilt. Yep. Uh, Tennessee went four and eight last year. They have got the uh, the number twelve toughest schedule in the SEC. It's only number fifty four in the country, so it works out pretty well for them. But as far as SEC experience goes, they are number twelve there. Number 87 in the country as far as experience, which might be good. Got to bring in some fresh blood. Yeah, you got that Jeez. right. Uh, the average recruit for Tennessee is actually number seven in the conference, right? Dead middle, 3.38 stars. They've got some good players. Uh, you know, not a lot of offensive line starts. Uh, not a lot of uh, yardage coming back and whatnot, but that could be good. Uh, we don't know if uh, Justin Garantano is going to start – I believe it's going to be Keller Christ. Uh, I'm, I'm just fully believe. See, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, to act like we know anything about these players today while we're recording this, it, it is a little bit ridiculous. But, Agreed. But I know this. I trust the man that's making the decisions. I think for a team that had a dumpster fire of a coaching situation, they kind of landed on a pretty good situation. Yeah, like and then like I said, I'll jump on Jeremy Pruitt in, in our so, hot takes. But but no, let me ask you one question. There's okay. one game. So what was their over under? The over under for Tennessee is five and a half. Oh, I'm going over on that. I've I am got too. I've got Tennessee at nine and three. What do you got? Holy, them at? Lo- I've got them at six and six. So I got them at nine and three. And 
the one game I gave him a W for, I, I'm a little wonky on, which is West Virginia. All right, here's I've got them losing to West Virginia, Florida, at Georgia, at Auburn, Alabama, at South Carolina. That's a lot. Of, like the road games there at South Carolina, at Auburn, at Georgia. I just don't see how they. I'm, I'm just. I've watched enough football to know they're going to win one of those games. They're probably there's a chance they can win two of those games. And then Florida, like Alabama. So to just so to just assume West so just assume they're going to lose all these games where these teams are supposedly better than them is 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 just making a really bad assumption. It's a, it, it's a tough stretch right there. It like is you got, a tough you got stretch. At, but you got Florida at the Georgia. Idea of them coming out winless out of all that is is a little ridiculous. At, They'll win some of these games. Okay, okay, I'm, I can I can see where you're coming from. I, but I've got them winning East Tennessee and UTEP, and I could see yeah. them being close games with Florida at Georgia, a bye week at Auburn, Alabama, and at South Carolina. But then I've got them winning all three or all four games to end the season. To get yeah. to a bowl game. Yeah. So, Charlotte, Kentucky, Missouri, and then at Vandy. Like and, I, and that makes sense. That makes sense. So, I think I'm, I've got them going to a bowl game. Six and six, I think, would be good for Pruitt this year. Like, got, for, for what got they've lot, got. I got them a lot better than that because I think they're going to win some of the. Now, I don't think they'll win all of the games that I think they might, but they're going to win some of those games. You, you got them beating West Virginia. Yeah. You got them beating Florida. So, and, I just think I got them beating several. I just, in that hard stretch. I think they're going to win three out of five of those difficult games. Okay. And if they only win two out of five of them, then I still go over the six. That, or the, whatever, the five and a half it was. Yeah, five and a half. Uh, Vanderbilt, they went five and seven last year. They uh, they got a win over Tennessee again last year. Uh, Derek Mason took a six and six team, went to five and seven last year. Uh, their over under is four this year. They... They've got a, a lot of experience, or not a lot of experience, but uh, they're number eight in the SEC. A lot of offensive line experience, which helps for what they try and do on, on offense. Uh, they're number four in the SEC as far as offensive line starts. They've got the ninth toughest schedule. Their experience, like I said, is number eight. And over under four wins. I've got them under the four wins. I've got them at three and nine. I got a push. I got them at four and eight. All right. I've, I've got them... 0 oh, and eight in the SEC. Do you See, have them well, no, winning an SEC I've, game? Yeah, I've got them beaten. I mean, I've got them beaten Missouri, um, and that's it. Yeah, as far as the SEC, you got them one and seven in the SEC. Yeah. So they'll beat Middle Tennessee. They'll beat Nevada. They'll beat Tennessee State. Their other non-conference game. It's going to be kind of fun for me to watch Vanderbilt at Notre Dame. What would be fun about that? Just because I one, I don't think Notre Dame is going to be as good this year, and two, like. This is this just, is something just the that, names like the names on the jerseys. That's that's it. This is one of the things that pisses me off about what other conferences do, though. Okay, other conferences like to come in, and some of our big boys do the same thing. Okay, we we say, oh, we're gonna go play a hard team from another conference. Come here, Rutgers. We just beat a Big Ten team. C- come on, man. Come like on. that. Notre, that ain't Notre, a Big Notre, Ten Dane, team. Notre Dame's gonna hang their hat on. We're gonna get an SEC win. And that should matter in the college football playoff ranking or the bowl ranking or all this other bull crap. And it shouldn't. It just shouldn't. There are haves and have nots. And and if you go into the Big Twelve and you beat up on Kansas, you don't get to brag about it. You just don't. I I'm with you. So, I completely agree. But that's gonna happen. Oh yeah. That's gonna happen. Oklahoma hung a lot of L's on Tennessee back in the trash days and all we hear about is their record against the SEC. Like, well, yeah, you got three of them against one of the worst <laughs> programs in our conference for a decade. Congratulations! All right, so you've got uh, I've got Georgia going eleven and one, but I got South Carolina at ten and two winning the uh, winning the East. I only went over on two of these, and that was Tennessee and South Carolina. I have South Carolina winning the East, and uh, yeah, I'm going to stand by that. I think they're going to win the East. I like it. I like it. All right, we're going to move into the rankings. All right, this week's ranking, we are going to do all-time NFL quarterbacks. Now, this is not any kind of standard. It's not a greatest of all time list. It's just, it's our favorite, right? I thought it was the greatest of all time. It's what we view as the greatest. How's that? Um, Which will be favorite. All right, that's not exactly how I did mine. (laughs) I did greatest of all time. (laughs) That's cool. That's cool. Greatest of all time works. Okay. So, uh, you will be 
picking first this week. I went first last week. Okay. So that and anybody that hasn't seen this before or heard this on the podcast, what we do is a draft format. So Chris picks first, and then I pick. We both have ten names or however many names, and then we draft them. So some of ours are not going to make the list. So this is going to end up being ridiculous since I picked greatest of all time and you picked your favorite. <laughs> no, so the number it's, two quarterback is going to be ridiculous. <laughs> not when I explain it a little bit. All right. It's so it, going to be ridiculous. Because, because as greatest, like there's a lot that can go into this. No, there's not. No, there's okay. not. It, the, on. Number, the number one quarterback in the history of the world is not debatable. It's well, just not. There's no opinions. Go ahead. There's this no, is this is your. It is just Tom. This is your pick. There you it go. It's just Tom. And if anybody <laughs> says anything otherwise in any bar, immediately call them an Uber or call nine one one and knock them out. Those are your two options. They don't need to drive home, or they don't need to walk ever again. I, I can understand that. Okay, number two, I got Michael Vick. The reason I've got Michael Vick is he completely changed. The how people viewed a quarterback. Did he? I I think so. Because I think Steve Young did everything Michael Vick did, just not as good as him. I think that Michael Vick was the first. At, I'm not going to say the first. Uh, he was an African American quarterback that changed people's perception of what that position could be. Mm. And I understand where you're coming from with Steve Young. I think I think Warren but, Moon did that. But he was no Michael Vick. Dante was, Culpepper did a lot of that. Michael Vick was. Was sold. McNair did a lot of that. Good gracious, you're killing me here. I am killing you. Michael Vick was a lot of fun because we, we both made two completely different lists. Michael Vick was was the video game all timer. Okay, I'm I'm not debating. He that. he got kids excited about watching football, and I understand that kids were already pretty excited about Everybody football. Everybody pretty much but likes like, watching football, but already. it changed things up. So I, I got Michael Vick number two on mine. Okay. <laughs> Well, Quit the, hating, the number two greatest quarterback of all time <laughs> is Joe Montana. How is it that we can't get on the same page with something very simple? Hey, we're going to do greatest quarterbacks. All right, sweet. I did greatest quarterbacks. That's, uh, and then I you just... did favorite quarterbacks. <laughs> but you told me greatest. Look, so. Michael Vick was not even my favorite quarterback. My favorite quarterback is in here, but we'll we'll get to him eventually. Uh uh, but, all right, so so number three for you is Joe, Joe Montana. Joe Montana. Joe, okay. no, no, he's number two. He's number two on this list. <laughs> he's number two, dude, that, on this list. You got draft pick number three, player. I'm, I'm, Joe Montana, I'm just, number three I'm behind help, Michael Vick. I'm helping our listeners. <laughs> number four for me is Drew Brees. Okay. Now Drew Brees, Super Bowl winning quarterback. MVP, like a MVP of the league at one point. He's short. He's an everyman. He took a city under his wing. Look, that dude will never have to work or do anything in New Orleans. He won't ever have to buy another drink, another meal, nothing in New Orleans for as long as he lives because of one season. But on top of that, he's still really good. He's like five foot eight. He's one of the best quarterbacks of all time. He yes. he made my list. He just wasn't for. My next quarterback is one that I would consider probably my second favorite quarterback of all time. If I was going to make Gary's list, uh, <laughs> he's he's fourth on my list. But I'm going to throw him up there early because he's number five I, on this. I list. no longer know where this <laughs> list is going. It's Brett Favre. Brett, okay. Brett, Brett Favre is is. Probably the most exciting quarterback that I've ever watched in my life. I was lucky enough to see his entire career. And I don't know, I, I bet you can count on one hand all the games that he played that I haven't seen, either through the beauties of YouTube and NFL films. Um just a just a really special guy. I they don't make guys like that anymore. No, what they, what they he did at Southern don't. Miss, just it like forget NFL. His playing at Southern Miss with wins over Alabama, wins over Florida State, like that was just a whole yeah. different deal, right? Yeah. He, and Brett Favre, I am with you. On. We've never seen a quarterback play with the kind of passion or excitement that he plays with. It just doesn't happen. Nobody no. has it. I agree. 
I agree. Uh, number six on the list, I've got Terry Bradshaw. Now, because of NFL films and everything else, look, this was my dad's favorite player growing up, and I have seen on YouTube and everything else. I've watched him, not to mention he is an incredible personality yeah. for the NFL now. So good. He's, uh, he's an actor. He's all these different things. And it wasn't so much his throwing ability or whatever back then. I mean, it, he played at Louisiana Tech, and he just kind of happened into the steel curtain, right? Yeah. Like, There's some truth Pittsburgh's defense won them championships. Oh, he played with like 13, 14 Hall of Famers on yes, the team. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, Terry Bradshaw, four the Super Bowls. The Blonde Bomber, man. He's, am- he, he's incredible. He was on my list of greatest of all time. That's because he's one of the greatest of all time. Because he's one of the greatest of all time. I'm with you. All right, my next one, as greatest of all time, should have trumped the last one, but I didn't know where you were, and and I wasn't going to let you take Brett, (laughs) Um, is John Elway. John Elway is the third best quarterback in the history of football. I I think you're probably right You can debate this point now. You're getting into those names, but I think he was incredible. What he did with his arms and his legs and just – I mean, he was good. He was really, really good. It was kind of weird to watch most all of his career and see him never win a Super Bowl, and then at the very end, win two back to. He just peeled two of them off and said, "All right, I'm good. I've waited my whole life. It happened at the end, but it happened. And I'm out." Yeah. So big Elway guy. But the the Super Bowl between him and Brett Favre was yes was epic. other world. Yeah. It and as good. a child, that was like the first time in my life I watched a game. I had no rooting interest. It was it was I, just fun I, to watch. Yeah, I didn't I didn't care who won, but I wanted to see a great game. And it wasn't a I don't care who won because it's Vanderbilt and Missouri. It was I don't care who wins because I love both of these teams. I love both of these quarterbacks. This was I mean that was our childhood. Those were our generational guys. Yeah, I I'm with you. Um, number eight on the list. Like I'm gonna toss in uh, Aaron Rodgers. At, wa- watching Aaron Rodgers play, it, 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 forget all the other crap. Just watching him play, I I love watching him throw other a football. Quarterbacks, that would be better to put on this <laughs> list than him. <laughs> Why do you hate so much? Why do you hate Aaron Rodgers so much? Anybody? Who, no, I'm not gonna like. I understand this. you hating get, hating my this. list. No, that's fine. But hating Aaron Rodgers? Yeah, yeah, a lot. A the lot. most talented quarterback in the NFL right now. A lot, a whole lot. <laughs> If you watch Aaron Rodgers control a football game, you watch him in a two-minute drill, there's no doubt that he needs to be on this list, and I've got him in here at number eight. Anybody who don't love their mama ain't making my list of nothing. (laughs) Of nothing. (laughs) Sorry, bastard. Okay. (laughs) My next one (laughs) is a good Tennessee man. Um He's probably, this better not be who I think it is. He's probably one of the greatest personalities sports has ever had. He might be the best sports personality of our lifetime. He might have the biggest time. forehead he, of he does. anybody. He absolutely does. I know who does. you're going with now. But, but Peyton Manning is one of – A, he should be number one on that list because of his sheer entertainment value. I'll buy anything that guy's selling. That dude went to Tennessee. If, if, you, ain't, I ain't, if you haven't – No. Yeah, but you're taking a guy out because of where he went to school and your irrational hatred for somebody you beat up on all the time. <laughs> I, that, we didn't beat up on him. He anyway, went 3-1 and one against Alabama. Anyway. I hate Peyton Manning. I have anyway, since 1995. But you have no logic or reasoning other no. than t- Tennessee. That's, no, it's completely emotional. That's I understand dumb. where I'm at with this, and I'm cool with it. But anyway, <laughs> if you haven't seen the commercial – for DirecTV that he did with his brothers. And I'm not talking about the ones that got him famous. I'm talking about the ones that were before DirecTV started putting him on the air. There's one called Football Cops. It will make you <laughs> fall in love with Peyton and Eli Manning like you've never fallen in love before. I need a sitcom of him ASAP. I need for a TV station to take when Eli retires to have Peyton, Eli, Archie, and Cooper to either call games or to have their own Sunday morning show, whatever. I need Cooper to be the butt of every joke. This is, <laughs> this is all I want in my life is more Peyton Manning on TV. And you know why I never bothered with him? He never bothered me because he never beat my guy. Who is your guy? Tom. Tom, oh. Tom never lost to him. <laughs> Ever. 
ever. He, he lost in, uh, what was it, 2016? And it wasn't Manning that beat him. It was when he was with the Broncos. Was that, that yeah. Didn't, yeah, yeah. You're like, that you're doesn't right. count. You, you want to give, <laughs> give Peyton credit for that? Okay. Peyton maybe That's beat him like three <laughs> times in his career. I'm with him. But we I'm used to him. debate who the best is. Wait, and, the and one that always won. The one that always the was. One that always yeah. won was what I used to say, and people would always get mad at me for saying that. I was like, yeah, but look at the stats. Anyway. Look at the blah, blah, blah. He is fantastic. And he was really good at football. Yeah, he was really good at football. <laughs> so it, it was more than just entertainment. He was, he was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, number 10 and the last one on our list, I got Steve McNair. Okay, that's not a bad one. So, I, I like Steve, uh, and we'll we'll do some honorable mentions to close it out. I, but I, I got two honorable mentions I'd so like to say. So, Steve McNair was, he is, he and Eddie George brought life to pro football in Tennessee. That's right. Right? That's right. Like that's, uh, nobody were, was a big Titans fan or anything when they first came here. But the whole state kind of rallied around them as they were making their Super Bowl run. The Music City Miracle, all this different stuff. And and Steve McNair, I mean, my gosh, there's all sorts of legendary stories that people not, tell about we're him. We're not going to get into that. We're not going to get into the locker room. Uh, get, just stop. Just but stop. but we're, it, we're, it's more than just, yeah. more than just yeah, the dang yeah, it's, it's Come on now. <laughs> Come it's on, more man. than just that. Come on. Man. But he, he was a personality. He was. He was he, great. And and he came from no. Alcorn State. Yeah. Like, it, it, I remember Alcorn State was the first small college that I really wanted to watch on TV. Like, they, they purposely put him on ESPN so that people could see this guy. He was unbelievable. Yeah, he was incredible. And so it, so no, I'm going to keep uh, Steve McNair at 10. I'm, no, I'm great with that. You won't get any argument from me on that. That's a that's a pretty unbelievable pick. I, I'm I'm a fan. I'm a huge McNair guy. My two honorable mentions, one, Dan Marino, a <laughs> never won a championship, but all-time quarterback greatness-wise, and entertaining, funny. Him in the Ace Ventura movie could, oh, not, still have, great. could not have been better. And then, and then my last one. I didn't watch the ESPYS. I'm probably going to go back and listen to his his talk just because it's him. But this has nothing to do with what he whatever he said recently because it's Jim Kelly. Yeah, Jim Kelly growing up was I. I kind of had like a lot of pity for him because they kept going to Super Bowls and losing, but those were really really great teams that the yeah. Bills had. I mean, they were all time great, and they and they just could not get over the hump. No, my Pats couldn't beat them. Not, not ever. And that yeah. guy was tough. They, they say that Kelly tough. That guy's, that guy's real tough. Real it's a, so people think of the uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers as yep. like a, a great team. That's kind of the same thing. They just can't get over the. Now they did it once, yeah. which is more than Buffalo did. That's right. But uh, my honorable mentions, I'm going to throw in Philip Rivers just because I love the guy. No, he's I'm got a, like I'm nine a, kids. No, he's got fourteen kids. Is it fourteen? No, it's, it's double Holy digits. I know that. God. I might have exaggerated that. He's so, got double-digit kids. Let, let's say somewhere between 10 and 14. He's got a lot yeah. of kids. Uh, and then I've got Kurt Warner. Greatest show on turf was, uh, oh, I mean, it revolutionized Kurt was the NFL at, at that point. Because uh, people just didn't run an offense like that. And he should have a Super Bowl ring. He absolutely should have a Super Bowl ring. He does have well, a Super Bowl um, ring. With the Arizona Championship. Oh, it, that, that was theirs. <laughs> that was theirs. <laughs> well, that, my gosh, it, your boy Tom got him out of one of them. Well, yeah, but I'm talking about Arizona – yeah, that James, year, like James Harrison, openly punched somebody in the back of the head repeatedly multiple times. The very next play wasn't called a foul, wasn't anything. James Harrison makes an unbelievable play on the ball, recovers a fumble, runs it back for a touchdown. That's the difference in the game. Yeah, James Harrison should have been ejected from the game immediately. You you can't do that. He did it. Breast didn't say anything. They sat and watched it. They took that from Kirk. Here's our recap. Number one, Tom Brady. Number two, Michael Vick. You know I'm not going to say anything bad about the Steelers. I can't I do it. I know. Uh, Tom Brady, Michael Vick. Number three, Joe Montana. Number four, Drew Brees. Number five, Brett Favre. Brett Favre. Uh, Favre. Number six, Favre. Number six, Terry Bradshaw, the blonde bomber. Number seven, John Elway. Number eight, Aaron Rodgers. Number nine, Peyton Manning. And number ten, Steve Air McNair. Terry Bradshaw, TB12 before Tom. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, you're so, right about that. I didn't even think about it. He, yeah, he's the man. All right, so that, that wraps up our ranking for this week. Song of the week, my choice. This is my personal favorite.
favorite song of all time. George Strait, Amarillo by Morning. I, I can't tell you why, but A, George Strait is the king. Probably my favorite solo artist of all time. It's just so good. Yeah, it's so This is a fantastic song. Such a good song. It just makes you feel like a, like a better person. It truly does. I don't know why. My wife loves George Strait. Yeah, we have that in common. So he's he's something else. He's uh he's got more number one hits, and I forgot the number. Than like it's like fifty nine or ten of like the greatest artists of all time combined. I yeah, mean, it's it's pretty astronomical. Well, I mean, it, country music like this was their guy. Like you know, yeah. Elvis was was rock guy. Right. Like That's to right. start out with. There's a reason. I mean, he's the king, and yeah. I mean, you know, he he goes in the same same breath as like Garth Brooks, and, Elvis, Garth, yeah. Michael. Yeah, you know. So it, I mean, all you got to say is George, yeah. and people for, like for for country know. music. He is he is, in my opinion, he's the greatest singer, and Garth is the greatest entertainer. I can get down with that, and that's 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 what I think. I just think he's, God, he's and fantastic. Here's the deal. Like he wasn't known for writing his own songs. He wasn't known for because Garth has a lot of input if he doesn't personally write it himself his own music but george was just like give me give me something yeah and i'll sing it and i'll make it great and uh there's something special about that so this leads us into hot takes we love hot takes i'm about to take a pretty dynamic twist off of george and amarillo by morning that's it that makes me feel good and this is about to make me feel bad um i'm gonna be a really really kind of a jerk right now I was coming up with hot takes. I had two or three that I wanted to go over. And then I got some news today. We're recording this on Monday about camps opening up. And one of my favorite teams, the Cleveland Browns, I'm very much looking forward to Josh Gordon's return to football. And I get report today that Josh Gordon is not allowed to report to camp because the NFL wants, hasn't caught him doing anything else. No issues, no problems. They just want him to make sure that he takes an extra look at himself and understands the gravity of the situation and, and, and his ability to play in the NFL because of his past transgressions. I just saw what you wrote on your Yeah, my, my notes. My notes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's written really big. It's one real line. Real quick. <laughs> Roger Goodell has to be one of the greatest pieces of trash the world has ever seen. <laughs> ever. Ever. And I'm not going to get into comparing him to some of the world's greatest pieces of trash because that would do, A, a disservice to people who are real victims, and, and B, it would make Roger Goodell look good, and nothing should ever make this man look good. Why he continues to go after Josh Gordon and they are making this out to be like this guy was some mass murderer or did some heinous, heinous thing. The guy got caught smoking pot, okay? Is it against the rules? Yeah. He he paid his punishment? Sure. Well, then he got caught smoking pot again, but really, he didn't. He absolutely didn't. His last time for testing positive was such a minute trace of THC that the people at the lab said they've never found anybody who tested this low before ever that wasn't a negative test but the nfl says any trace amounts it's an automatic year-long suspension well, what, what was it it said that uh like one it could have been could, secondhand so they, so or they it could have been left yes, in his body yeah, from before they they had theories about how an individual can test so low and and it get this result and the theory was it's so small it has to be um secondhand smoke it has to be and or because his THC count in the past has been so high because of the volume he used to smoke, it's just taken that long to get out of his system, and he still has trace amounts in it. The NFL says, we don't care. He's gone. He's gone for a year. The guy didn't get intoxicated, get behind the wheel of a car. He didn't hurt anybody. He didn't get into a fight. Yeah, there was no domestic abuse anybody. here. He didn't, he's never put his hand on a woman that we know of or a child or another adult male. So... 
you know, he hasn't done any of these things, but he's being looked at and watched like he is a, some heinous serial offender. Roger, you're no longer Mr. Goodell. You're no longer given any name of respect whatsoever. You're just a piece of trash. That's all you are. And, and let me tell you why I'm taking this personally. If you were to take a person, I, I'm mocked a little bit because I have two teams in the NFL. I'll take that. That's fine. Make like, fun of me like all you one want. of the best and, yeah, and one, of the, one worst. of the worst. Yeah, that's okay. But if you were to do a Venn diagram of somebody who loves the Patriots and worships at the feet of Tom Brady, and and then another circle of all the people in the world that that love Cleveland and really, really love Josh Gordon, I would venture to say that I am the only person that fits in both of those Venn diagrams. I, I would agree with that. Roger? This is a shot at me, and so I'm going to make it my life's work to take shots at you. For, for the rest of eternity, there is nothing good that you will ever do to change my mind. If I ever meet you personally, wearing a shirt with you looking like a clown would be something you'd say, thanks, that's not very disrespectful, because the things that will come out of my mouth will probably be way more disrespectful. You want to say what's on the sheet? I just said Roger is a dick. That was that's my a, okay. me, me taking notes. I was just like, this guy's pissed me off <laughs> to a point where my my hot take is just going to be, I'm hot. I'm pissed off right now, and I don't like this guy. We're treating Josh Gordon like he has been locked up for years for doing some heinous crime. And his crime was he smoked some pot, and he's a football player, and our bylaws say you can't do that. But we'll shoot these guys up with more opioids than anybody's business. Why don't the NFL look into that? And not the CD, yeah. well, and not 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 the CD, but along with CET, CTE, CTE, yeah, and and see what's <laughs> killing these folks. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. I'm just with a, you. Just a piece of trash. Just a piece of trash. Now my hot take is not going to be nearly as hot. No. However, after last week's incident, I guess you could say with SEC media <laughs> days with with the Georgia fans taking shots at Jeremy Pruitt, uh, I, I was a little perplexed as to why they would be taking shots with Georgia and Mark Richt like I understand people love Mark Richt at Georgia like they want to stand up for him he was their guy etc cetera, etc cetera. but they all came out and said that Jeremy Pruitt is not head coach material this was David Pollock and Aaron Murray he's not head coach material because he doesn't know how to treat people and he's disrespectful and blah 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 look football is a bottom line business Either you know how to win or you don't. My hot take is that Jeremy Pruitt will win the SEC East within the next three years. I think that he completely turns around that Tennessee program. The guy knows how to recruit. He understands how to build a championship program. And the people that don't think that he understands how to do that just don't get it. No. He played football at Alabama under Gene Stallings. He didn't win a national championship there, but... Stallings knew how to build a championship caliber team, right? He played in 95 and 96. He started out at Middle Tennessee. Um, when he went into coaching, he started out at Hoover High School, right? At Hoover, he was the defensive backs coach in 2004. They won a state championship that year. In 2005, he got moved to defensive coordinator. They won a state championship that year. 2006, they were runners-up. 2007 through 2009, he was Alabama's defensive uh, – or no, he was uh, uh, the director of player personnel – Look, they won a national championship in 2009. He was the secondary coach from 2010 through 2012. That's two more national championships. At Florida State, he was a defensive coordinator under Jameis Winston's team. Won a national championship then. Went to Georgia for two years under Mark Richt. What everybody got so mad about was that Pruitt had the nerve to not be okay with losing. In what other sport is that a problem? It's it's not and and you see this in the NFL. I, I, I hate always bringing everything back to the Patriots because that's my team, and I don't want to make everything about them. But but it's what you it's but, it's what you know. But but it's no, why I keep bringing it, up it, Alabama. It, it, right? it fit it fits into this equation because people all these players leave the Patriots and they all complain about how big of a jerk Bill is. It, it just one of those things where he doesn't tolerate losing. He doesn't tolerate shortcuts, and he doesn't. He doesn't handle people not doing their job. Right. 
So. It's why when players leave New England, yeah, they talk they, bad about this. Well, and, but they're, they're they're rarely as good as they were in New England. Correct. Like Correct. that's just bottom line. Yeah. So, and Pruitt, of course, came back to Alabama as defensive coordinator, won a national championship last year, uh, had pr- the best defense in the country in 2016, and and couldn't get the national championship because of different factors. Yeah. But either way, he's got multiple state championships and national championships. The guy knows what it takes to build a winning program. He will win the SEC East in the next three years. And once Saban retires, there's no doubt in my mind he will win an SEC championship for Tennessee. Bottom line. You talk big for a guy that hadn't won a lot of SEC championships. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You got more that. national championships than you do SEC championships. No, I think it's the exact same number. There's something wrong with that, by the <laughs> way. It's probably <laughs> – Everybody in the world believes there's something wrong with that, except for people from Alabama. So no. no. No, 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 no. You can be third in the West, but you can be best in the country. That makes right. sense. <laughs> That's how math works in Alabama. All right, we're going to move off of that. <laughs> we're jumping into fact or fiction to close this up. Fact or fiction time. My turn to pose the question. It's, it's a little bit of a weird question, okay? I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I'm not sure exactly what this is, but I'm but when you bring up that it's a weird question, I yeah. immediately jump in. Yeah. Ah. Uh, all right. So the British Open was this week, or the Open Championship, we in America call it the British Open, even though it's played <laughs> in Scotland. We in America. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's how we do it in America. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if it's over there, it's got to be British, right? Sunday. <laughs> Sunday was, was a pretty epic day for – well, I say it. Sunday was a great opportunity for for golf to be really really amazing and and relevant and everything that, else, oh right? yeah relevant talking about dominating sports headlines today yeah like you and i play golf it, yeah. it, but i don't watch it as often well, as I, I watch it pretty religiously and i watched every minute of this but i didn't watch every minute I, sports are entertainment we agree with that right yes we, we need to come to a couple of premises sports are entertainment fact or fiction I believe as long as you can maintain that fourth element of secrecy that we as fans don't know this is happening. Well, secrecy and, and somewhat unpredictability. Maybe. Yeah, oh, no, but yeah, you got to still have unpredictability. All right. I believe sports would be better if we could fix outcomes. Like make better storylines. All for the, like, like all WWE. Four, all four storylines. See – not, not w, all the time. Not WWE. So let me give you the example. So we're going to talk about the British Open here. Okay. My my reasoning for that is is we had a part on yesterday of the 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 golf tournament where Spieth is throwing darts, Tiger is making a charge, and Rory is right behind him coming up on the end. And that's three of the the and, five biggest names yeah, in, in that golf. That probably is the three biggest names in golf. Well, like, I mean, you got to throw in Phil Mickelson. People yeah, still, but but like, I think all three him. of those guys are maybe bigger than Phil. Dustin Johnson's number one in the, in the world. He didn't even make the cut. He's not as famous as those three guys. I don't think exactly. Um, yeah. I think, and then shortly after, like this rush kind of happened. Tiger poops the bed, double bogeys, bogeys. He's out of it. Jordan forgot completely how to putt. Literally calls his caddy over to help him read a three-foot putt and still lips it. Like, just – and that's been happening to Jordan lately, getting in his head. He can't putt. Um, and and Rory finished okay, six under, whatever, but but not enough to make that surge and, and really get the win. Uh, Francisco Molinari, yeah. I think it's how you pronounce his last name. I should know, being the resident Italian. Um, <laughs> super proud that a, that a dude from Italy won. Not taking anything away from him. This is back-to-back tournaments that he's won. But the storyline in golf, if we would have had a playoff going into after that thing was over with, with Spieth and Rory and Tiger on a Sunday, would have been epic. Yeah, enormous. To- not just great, epic. All time, one of the greatest finishes in the sports history. So I don't think you should fix something to to get here. But as soon as you see, we got about six holes left to go. I need to I need to find one of those Buffalo Wild Wing switches and make that happen, <laughs> and and get this. I don't care what the outcome is. 
I'm not predicting that. I'm not crowning a winner. I am, unfortunately, saying, Francisco, you don't get to, you don't get to make this run. And yeah. any all the rest of these guys, maybe throw Justin Rose in there because he's the European. But Roy's European too. Roy's Wales. He's all right. But like, let's have a playoff with three of the biggest names in golf. They're right here. They're so close to the end. Two of them just give up and just roll over and die. And the yeah. other one was a little too far behind. That's to that's make when a I turned it off. Is is when Tiger Doubles, basically went then out. bogeys and then it's yeah. out and Spieth misses like four putts straight. Now when he when he birdied fifteen. I thought, okay, like we we might have a shot here, but then on sixteen, there was no shot, and I just turned it off. Like there I, are just times back to the original question where I wish outcomes would be better when I don't have a dog in the fight, just because I think it makes for such a more entertaining sport. I'm gonna go with fact because yes, like the storyline would be so huge. People would be talking about it nonstop. That Sunday would heard, live forever. I haven't heard it, anybody no. even really talk about no. the like other than bringing up Tiger. That's right. But the fact that he didn't win, not just that he didn't win, he looked so good and then he looked like old Tiger for the last 4 or 5 holes. Yeah. That's that's what happened. I mean, it, it was the last well, 6 holes. Yeah, because the yeah, the, the right. ones before right. fifteen is where he you know double bogeyed and bogeyed. That's it. You're right. And look, it, that was a tough course for anybody. I mean, the bunkers, super t- like no. big, tall, whatever, tough to hit out of. Uh, but I mean, my gosh, the the shot where Tiger hit it into the bunker, and then knocked it out of the bunker onto the green, was awesome. Yeah, incredible. So I just it was think, it was a lot of fun I to wish watch. that the ball that hit the fan in the head could have somehow like ricocheted off that guy and somebody throws a ball into or goes into a tree and oh he got a magic kick and it's on the green and we can get this thing to the playoff we can kind of make everybody else fall away we get this three to a playoff and then yeah. whatever happens happens that round would live forever in golf history yes I agree we, it would be something we would watch. For decades to come, I I am going fact on that. So I agree with you. And golf is one of those sports where it needs it. I agree. I don't think all sports do, but not all sports. Like I, I like how the NFL is set up. NBA, we might could maybe fix it to where Golden State wasn't so dominant. Well, you just need no. You but, just need a better storyline. You know, that's yeah. just it. I mean, you need something entertaining to keep people going. Baseball could sure use it. But I'm the I'm also the guy that. Thinks now I have no control over this, so don't kill me, all my friends that are Cubs fans. I think the storyline is better if they lose that World Series. I think they went from being the lovable losers to just being another big team that spends a lot of money. Now, yeah. now I know that it's hard for me to say that being a Sox fan, and I remember 2004. I remember everything about it. I remember where I was. I remember who I was with for all seven games of the ALCS and for all four games of the of the of the Cardinal series I was with the same person every night and and in in one or two different places I remember almost every pitch to those games so I I understand that that was epic but for the story as soon as we won we're just another big team that spends a lot of money that yeah. won us won a world series yeah it's not as it's not as much fun no now, the storyline last year, yeah. the Astros winning it, not only did they win it, they went through the deepest run of Blue Bloods in baseball history. Who all did they beat last year? Do you remember? They had to beat the Yankees. They had to beat the Red Sox. And then they had to beat the Astros, uh, the, the Dodgers. Uh, that's Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, That's pretty crazy. I mean, there there's not a bigger salary, bigger famous – name in baseball that you got to go through. You go through the Sox, they went through the the Yankees after that, and then they go through the Dodgers. I like it. That's a run. That's a great story. That's it is. It's absolutely a great story. I'm with you. I'm with you. All right, that's going to wrap up the show. You guys know what to do. Go check out winningcureseverything.com. If you have not subscribed already, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, Go subscribe. Leave us an iTunes review, five stars. Give us a written review. Tell us what you like, what you don't like, all that good stuff. Uh, That helps out the numbers. That helps out 
getting more people in here, right? We made a commitment that every 25 we get, we're going to make a donation. Exactly. And we've made one donation. We're at 33. Yeah. We need uh, we gotta 17 get to 50. more. Come on, guys. So help us out with that. Go knock it out. I don't like sick kids. Well, I mean, I don't like sick kids. YouTube. You want to stop sick kids? YouTube.com slash Winning Cures Everything. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, thank you. We appreciate you. If you're listening on the podcast, we appreciate you guys as well. Share us out on Facebook, facebook.com slash Winning Cures Everything. Give us a like there. We're on Twitter, at Winning Cures. You can also follow myself, my personal account, at Gary WCE. You can follow Chris. Chris B. Giannini. And from there, go check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. Also, big shout out, like usual, mybookie.ag. Sign up, promo code WCE50. You get a 50% deposit bonus, which means you put in 50 bucks, they're going to give you 25 for free. You put in 100, they're going to give you 50 bucks for free. You can't beat that deal, especially for the bunch that's got the best online sports book, the best layout for an online sports book. Everything about it's cool. So go check it out. For now, though, we're going to get out of the way. Later. We hope you guys have a good week. It's time for the rundown. Remember, check out winningcureseverything.com. You can give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. You can follow us on Twitter, at winningcures. You can follow myself, at GaryWCE. You can follow me at Chris B. Giannini, C-H-R-I-S-B-G-I-A-N-N-I-N-I. You can also email the show, that's winningcureseverything at gmail.com. And we now have a voicemail line. That number is 551 226 Nine eight nine nine. If you want to call and bash us for talking bad about your favorite team, or praise us, or just tell us about how awesome your team is doing, leave us a voicemail. That number again is 551-226-9899, and we may toss it on the show. Thank you for supporting this show, and until next time, have a good one, guys. Hey, don't forget, subscribe to the Winning Cures Everything podcast on iTunes, and make sure you leave a review. For every 25 written five-star reviews we get on iTunes, we are donating to St. Jude's Children's Hospital and Le Bonheur's Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. So subscribe and review on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, and all your favorite podcast apps. Remember, the Winning Cures Everything podcast.